Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Bob O'Donnell, and I'm the President and Chief Analyst at Technolysis Research. And I'm pleased to be joined by Amir Khazroshahi uh, from Intel. And Amir is the uh, VP and CTO of AI products at Intel. Welcome, Amir. Thank you. So, <clears throat> obviously one of the hottest areas out in the world these days is around AI. And there's a lot of efforts happening around AI-specific uh, semiconductors, chips designed specifically to accelerate AI. That's, of course, what Nirvana did, and that's you were one of the founders of Nirvana that Intel purchased, uh, what was about 18 months ago? August two, 2016. Yeah, let's go, almost three years now. So talk a little bit first for folks who may not be familiar with some of what you've done there, and then let's get into the details of what's going on. But first, talk about Nirvana and the products that you are working with Intel now. So uh, you mentioned uh, um, AI and this, this new workload, emerging workload of machine learning. And um, for this workload, we've designed at Nirvana and now at Intel. And not largely our group has grown dramatically since we joined, and it's mo mostly Intel. And we have a lot of new friends. Um, and the technologies we're building, we're building a slew of products that are specifically for machine learning and AI. We have. The workloads in AI, um, we don't need to get into it in too much detail, right. but they're roughly separated into training and learning a right. model and an inference. Right. Uh, you have a corpus of data and you learn a model from the data and then you do inference where I send you new, new samples of data and I categorize an image as having a dog in it or whatnot. Right. So we have been building this technology at Intel and it's coming out right. fairly soon. I'm very excited about it. And there have been some indications in the AI domain that this is going to be a success. And I can go through some of these with sure, you. Sure, that'd be great. So um, of course, there is the present, and then there's one year out, and then five years out. This is how I kind of wrap my head around this uh, really rapidly moving area. So the present uh, at Intel is uh, in the data center group where I am. We're trying to build AI systems. But in the near future, uh, what is going to be the uh, transformative, what's going to be transformative in the AI domain? And we have a very clear signal from some events in the last six months. And they come from two entities, OpenAI mm -hmm. and Google DeepMind. Got it. They are doing really remarkable work in advancing the cutting edge in uh, research in machine learning. And for example, OpenAI has released a language model, GPT-2. Mm -hmm. And it also has released a game playing engine for Dota. You're five uh, agents playing against five human agents, mm -hmm. and it's outperforming in this task. Google has uh, AlphaZero, um, a, a general game playing engine for chess, Go, and so forth. AlphaFold, something that predicts how proteins can uh, fold. It's a, it's a grand challenge in science. Right. So w what is, why is this relevant? It's relevant because these are really transformative algorithmic breakthroughs. And if the past is going to repeat in our domain, these technologies that seem kind of far flung today are going to come into businesses and ad serving and other processes in the near future. I don't know if it's going to be two years, one year. The time scale of things are becoming compressed. So they're going to be relevant very soon. And what's enabled these successes uh, as OpenAI themselves have posted on their blog post is the magic of deep learning and machine learning is in the training. And they've been able to scale with more data and more compute with the same models. It's not super uh, magical sounding, but what's enabled them is technology to scale and build larger models with more compute. So what specifically about these AI specific accelerators makes them different from say a CPU, right? There's been a lot of talk about the fact that um, much of the AI workloads being done today is in fact being done on CPUs. That's right. But, so talk a little bit more about what are the unique characteristics of these uh, chips and why is it important to have a dedicated you know, bank of these or even a dedicated cloud of AI specific uh, accelerators? So, so good question. Uh, so let's talk about the neural network processor from Intel, from my group. Neural, we have two currently we've announced and mm -hmm. potentially more in the future. We have a training chip and an inference chip. Right. The training chip performs elemental operations that are necessary for machine learning that are generally things like matrix multiplication, and nonlinear functions and so forth. And it ex executes them with lots of density on a chip and at scale. And there are some architectural features for this chip that are unique, that are not present in a CPU, a general purpose processor, mm -hmm. as well as a GPU. A <coughs> GPU is also not 
specialized enough to handle these op op operations as efficiently. Okay. That's one element. Uh, the chip itself looks kind of like a neural network processor baked into silicon. And another feature that's really important is that it, you can have many chips, chips linked together uh, to work in concert as a single large chip. That enables you to run very large models and um, in concert, uh, right? So one operation, one matrix multiply operation I mentioned, you can run it on a, a thousand chips. And this is what's really driving these advancements at OpenAI mm -hmm. and, and Google. And the oper it's, we're still at the very early stages in these new architectures. Mm -hmm. And frankly, they're not that great in the sense that they're, they're outperforming GPUs today, but there's an enormous room for improvement and we have to start somewhere. Sure. So I see things like even our processor and this wildly successful Google TPU cloud, where they've done a phenomenal job. I think they've basically nailed the future of our field. Right. Um, they're they're going to improve dramatically right. on hardware, and I know you care a lot about software, all across the stack. So I'm looking forward to the improvements. We're not there yet today, but we're already beating the state of the art other stuff. Yeah, which is great. And you know, the other big question, and you started to refer to it this on the software side. I mean, one of the challenges we've seen with AI is that <clears throat> it requires some really deep level expertise. Uh, from data scientists and computer scientists who really know this stuff. And frankly, that's a small group right now. Mm -hmm. So there's been a lot of efforts to simplify some of this software, and particularly around this notion of frameworks, where you build um, this software tool that abstracts away from some of the low-level hardware. And the question that raises is, if you abstract away too much from the hardware, do you lose the unique benefits of a TPU, whether it's from you or from Google uh, or even a GPU from NVIDIA and the other players as well? How do, you, how do we think about frameworks versus the unique characteristics of the hardware? So that's a very good question. Uh, I, so I'm, first, I'm not alarmed. I think it's a really good development. I would like to see even more of this. And it's actually quite challenging to make, uh, to abstract things out. I would mm -hmm. like it to be even abstracted out more um, but let's just go through the stack. Um, what is the s typical stack for AI uh, and, and, um, it, today? So you say you have the hardware, and it's not just the processor, the CPU, TPU, GPU, FPGA. Right. I would argue that there's going to be more of these things, not okay. less. There are some, uh, uh, some people who think that, oh, let's just combine things and, or make the GPU a better tensor processor. I feel like there's just going to be more stuff. And above that are lower level libraries for doing uh, elemental operations like matrix multiplication I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Then there's the frameworks. Then there's orchestration layer. Then there's algorithmic layer. Then there's product. Wow. Yeah. And then there's data stores and there's interconnects <laughs> and the data stores have to be NVM or they have to be a non-volatile memory or uh, persistent. And there's so much engineering that has to go into building a today's um, AI system that uh, lots of, you get tripped up in many places. So uh, coming back to your question on the frameworks, the frameworks have been a really important demo democratizer of AI. Right. And the frameworks uh, are TensorFlow. That's been one of, it's one of the most successful open source projects of right. all time, as well as PyTorch and MXNet. And uh, basically each m mindshare entity has their own framework and they're competing to some extent. Right. And there's probably going to be a few winners and TensorFlow and PyTorch, for example, they enable data scientists to build models, train them, and serve them. However, it's not quite enough. And as you mentioned, that area is evolving. And it's TensorFlow now, it's TensorFlow serving light. There's a mo mobile component. There's a quantization component. They're getting integrated into uh, orchestration layers. They're incorporating privacy. Privacy is one of the main issues we, um, yeah. I get asked about. Uh, so that ecosystem is growing, and it, to some extent, it is, uh, it is abstracting out all the complexity underneath. In a data center, the har hardware uh, of all sorts are going to be there, and you don't want the data scientists to worry about, well, FPGAs are really good for inference. They're very low latency. They're very uh, reconfigurable. Microsoft has a really great effort called Catapult and right. Brainwave around that. CPUs are evolving to be really uh, good at everything, including inference. Mm -hmm. And recently, uh, one, of, one of our really clever engineering teams uh, used two of our best um, CPU Xeon processors to beat uh, NVIDIA's state-of-the-art GPU mm. at the most GPU-like task, which is ResNet 50. It's an image uh, computer vision task. So uh, I'm building neural network processors at Intel. My biggest competitor is actually our own, our Xeons. Right. So, 
uh, friendly competition. Yeah. <laughs> so again, the, the frameworks, um, they're getting, they're making it uh, possible for data scientists to, um, to make it e easier for them to build and deploy. The whole life cycle is made possible partly by the frameworks, but there's a lot of other cool software that is above or horizontal the frameworks to, to make it uh, easier. Got it. So you, you mentioned a couple of interesting things that point to sort of where uh, AI specific hardware is going to go or, or neural network specific processors are going to go. You talked about the ability that some types of architectures might be better for some workloads, which would imply that maybe we see you know, an NNP for financial models and an NNP for language models and an NNP for something else, as well as this notion of taking some of the core architectural benefits of an NNP and migrating it down to perhaps a general purpose CPU or a mobile part. Can you give us a little sense of how you see the future of um, AI specific hardware semiconductors you know, evolving? Okay, so there was two, two questions. So the first question, are, are we going to require um, different kinds of hardware uh, architectures for different problems? <coughs> Um, so this is going to be uh, determined by economics and other factors, but uh, it, there is an argument for it that if you have a speech model, it has different kind of compute requirements. Right. The architectures are different, the data flow is different, the latency requirements are different than a computer vision model that has to analyze a 3D uh, volumetric data like an MRI. So clearly you can optimize architectures even for those two different mm -hmm. domains. However. Today, there's not an economic incentive to do so. Perhaps in the future, there Fair may enough. be. And one of the things that would be enabling is uh, that the process of building hardware becomes cheaper and easier. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to build processors. I've discovered this. As a neuroscientist <laughs> at Intel, I'm, it's quite a learning experience. So, on, on, uh, so I don't think right now you need more than training and inference, this bifurcation. And, and uh, perhaps uh, there would rejoin, or there'd be a little bit uh, more salient differences between inference processors and training processors. Um, to your, uh, your second question was, again, remind me well, what well, is... Bringing down some of the architectural benefits to, from the data center parts, which these that's right. first ones are, down to, say, client devices and, and other endpoints. So, a great question. It's already happening in the following sense, that uh, at the edge and going to the data center, um, you need different kinds of architectures uh, as you go from one from this continuum from edge to data center. In the following sense that the edge device, like my cell phone, is an SOC. That SOC looks like a little brain. It has not just a massive matrix multiply engine like the TPU, the Google TPU has been successful, has, has that. It has a vision processing unit, it has a speech unit, it has something that analyzes your face for security, mm -hmm. it has a neural networking processing unit, it has a GPU, it has all these little uh, um, IPs that are for different functions. Right. However, as you get to the data center, there's a strong argument for taking all those little pieces and making them huge racks of uniform hardware and interconnecting them efficiently uh, in the following sense. You can have a rack of Xeons and you can have a rack of NNP training uh, chips. And uh, the, the timing of inference is such that the interconnect between those two, um, two racks is on the order of a millisecond. And the requirement, which is fairly stringent, I send you something and you compute on it and you return a response, it's on the order of microseconds. So, so clearly you, not feasible in that interconnect kind of world. Well, well, no, you, so in a data center, it makes sense to separate them out into separate right. racks and depend on the interconnect. Uh, so um, you don't have to put an NMP IP into a Xeon necessarily. However, um, there are scenarios where um, that might be necessary. And the CPU, our, the Intel Xeon, is actually evolving in this direction that because of economic incentives, it's a highly optimized. The Xeon is a miracle of engineering. Right. There's, uh, it's, it's much, it's, I think, two orders of magnitude more complicated than an NMP and a GPU. It's super optimized for data center workloads. Involved lots of things. Right. Uh, encryption, uh, and MPEG encoding, and it's very low latency in some ways. Optimized for latency. Anyway, you could see that these, these, um, these cores will go into um, the Xeon. And maybe if you look at the laptop, a processor. Mm -hmm. The laptop uh, processor used to be a CPU, and over time it evolved to incorporate a GPU component mm -hmm. for display and so right. forth. And over time, that GPU component has grown in size. Yep. So now it's actually dominated by the GPU, and then there's a CPU on your, your, your mobile phone. So maybe that will be um, that that we will recapitulate this process in the data center. 
I, I don't really see a strong hint of that. Right. But at, at the same time, you made an interesting comment earlier about this notion of you know, clouds being able to leverage AI mm -hmm. uh, specific processors because we are seeing these workloads that are cloud-based services where there is a strong AI or machine learning or neural network component to them. Can you talk a little bit more about how you see those evolving? You mentioned Google, but obviously you've got Amazon, you've got Microsoft, you've got these other players. Mm -hmm. How are they going to address some of these issues? Gotcha. So uh, I stated at the beginning that this, uh, this concept of a TPU cloud, this mm -hmm. basically is machine learning supercomputer. And by the way, TPU, just to be clear, you're not referring to Google specific, but just the, the more generic notion uh, of a TPU? Yes, sorry for this. Yeah. So the TPU stands for Transfer Processing Unit, right. and on Intel's brand is a neural, neural network processor. Right. There, there are differences, salient differences between them, but they are in the same class of Got distributed it. linear algebra processors, distributed either on a single chip or on multiple chips. And um, there is, uh, this is uh, the TPU cloud is a proof point. Mm -hmm. So as a success of OpenAI and DeepMind, customers are coming to us and saying, we have a gap. We don't have a TPU cloud. Please build us one. Got it. Not just one TPU pod, which is the entity of a thousand, but can you build us many? And please don't charge us too much for it. <laughs> so, and then provide the interconnect that lets you make them part of the exactly the yes system. interconnect yeah. is really critical and then there is uh, there is the mass farms of GPUs that you can rent out at Azure right. and Amazon however uh, it the, the question the question I have is do you really do you really want to waste the dollars on a GPU is a general purpose architecture you can do um, you can do graphics you can do numerical right. simulations I worked with GPUs quite a bit my PhD right. thesis depended on them I know them very well. Do you want something that is usable, is general purpose in my right. view, or do you want to use something that's specifically right. for doing distributed linear algebra right. to do large, sparse transformers? Right. So I don't know what the, there's many possible futures, and I think the space is exploding to such a degree that all of these things will be present in some proportion. Right. Um, that you will have, you'll see all these solutions. You'll see CPUs being used for inference for certain kind of workloads. You'll see GPUs for training for certain kind of workloads, and then for the really cutting edge transformative AI ideas, they'll be running on custom hardware like NMPs, TPUs, and so forth. Got it, fair enough. Well, thank you very much, Amir. We are thank unfortunately you. out of time, but a great uh, summation of all the major things were happening in AI Silicon, and uh, it's bound to be an interesting future, no, no question about it. It will. Thanks very much, Thanks. take care.